Okay, well, let's just keep doing it. It's time for us to do another class again fairly soon, too, my friend. Yeah, I would love to. We'll keep uh, it going. Live in a second. Right okay. All right, we are live. Okay. So let's say hi to everybody, shall we? All right. Good. Hey, everyone. Those of you who are watching, uh, I'm here with my friend Mike Godet. We're on opposite coasts. Mike is in Seymour, Connecticut, and I'm in Portland, Oregon. I'm John Stoll, and that's my friend Mike Godet on the other end. And we did one of these live. Um, YouTube concerts before, live streams, and we thought it would be great to do another. Mike and I also have a number of lessons that we've co-taught together for Mike Geller's Mike's Masterclasses site. Any guitar players who are watching, it's a terrific site that offers uh, hundreds of free individual lessons that you can buy. And you can see excerpts of the lessons Mike and I have done together. How many have we done together now, Mike? Maybe five, six of them together? We have five and there's a sixth one on the way. Excellent. So Mike and I both have uh, individual lessons. And Mike also has a great uh, YouTube feature, on, or I should say feature on his YouTube channel called Lick of the Week. That's how Mike and I met because he was kind enough to do one of my licks. So we, we've been interacting now doing lessons and having these conversations for, I don't know, eight, nine months now. But do check out uh, Mike's YouTube channel and his Lick of the Week and our lessons on Mike's masterclasses. Uh, I also have courses for True Fire Music, five of those, three for DC Music, couple of new releases on the Origin uh, label. So that's that's the commercial portion of our live stream today. Mm -hmm. John and also has Mike a great YouTube channel that I encourage everyone to check out too. I'll put a link. Thank you very much, Mike. So, you know, we're all obviously trying to create new ways to collaborate. Uh, and this is one of the ways we can do it. So what we thought we might do today is um, initially trade some courses on well-known tunes and then also play some solo pieces for you. Anyone who's watching who would like to chime in with a comment or question, please do so. And Mike and I had an idea, but before we went live, that might be fun. Those of you who are guitarists who would like to play along with us, I just grab your guitar and play along with us if you know the tune. And then if you have a comment or question on anything we played, uh, this is not a workshop per se, but if you'd like to address some guitar talk or some ideas, we'd be very happy to answer any questions. So Mike had initially suggested an old standard that we both like called You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To. Mike, do you know that version that Jim Hall did on the um, concierto record? Oh, of course. Yeah, that's the version yeah, that turned me on. Terrific yeah. version. Yeah, Jim put together sort of an all-star group. He did a number of recordings in the early 70s for Creed Taylor for CTI records. And on the concierto record, one side is sort of a jazz version of the concierto de Adam Wes, and the other side has some standards, including You'd Be So Nice. I think it's Roland Hanna, Steve Gadd, uh, Ron Carter, Chet Baker and Paul Desmond. Interesting combination yeah, of guys, but it, it, it sure worked well for the record. It's nice. So this is a good jam session tune. And uh, so we'll just trade some courses. And we're going to be in G minor for those of you who want to follow along. You want to jump in with the first course, Mike? Sure. All right. And I'll just we'll be a little bit of latency, but we'll do our thing. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Trace some eights now, Mike. You go first. Mail out for us. nice mike likewise we have kind of shared vocabulary in terms of some close intervals kind of pianistic style voicings and i think you and i both approach solo playing in the same way trying to sort of seamlessly transition back and forth between chords and lines when we play to be able to you know create a more pianistic sound not only in terms of the chords but how we blend chords and single lines together yeah i mean that's what i try to do it's not always successful but <laughs> that's usually the end well for for me either for me either but we we aspire to to that certainly and, um, you know, listening to guitar players who think like piano players like Lenny Bro or Jimmy Weibull or Ted Green, you know, gives us a sense of what's possible. Yeah, I love the voicings you play, too. I mean, the way that you utilize a lot of the open strings in some of these unique ways, you know, get some pretty interesting harmonic choices, which I always love to hear from your playing. 
No, oh, thanks. Well, likewise, you know, I think that's one of the nice things about collaborating. We can, you know, two guitars, we're one of the, one of the few instruments where we can play in duo, so we can inspire each other, talk shop a little bit about trading, ideas about chord voicings and voice leading to what we've done in some of our lessons, and it's great fun. We'll, 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 I, hope, I hope we'll have a chance to do many more together. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone's watching, uh, comment on levels, please, if the guitar levels seem okay and we're balanced properly. Uh, just please weigh in if anyone has any thoughts or comments or questions. Nine people watching. Great. Nobody, no uh, comments so far. But any questions, hey. any comments, anything you want to feel? Well, free to shoot guys, in welcome. Time. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Um, Mike's going to throw up a link to my PayPal account at the end, and you're very welcome to watch for free. But uh, if you're inclined, donations of any amount are gratefully accepted. But we're here to play for fun for us and for you. So uh, the donations are optional. So we thought the we'd link play, should actually uh, the link should be in the description of the video as well for anybody Great, super. listening. If it's not, let me know, but it should be. Great. So you know we try to support each other when we can. Let's put it that way. But in the meantime, we make music happily for anyone who wants to listen. We do it happily for free many days. <laughs> nice to get paid for it, but that's not why we do it. And I think music now more than ever maybe is a way to help lift each other and all of us up a little oh, yeah. to get us through this time. So Mike and I both like music from Brazil and probably the most well-known Brazilian composer in this country was Antonio Carlos Jobim, Tom Jobim. And I'm on a small mission to get my friends to learn a few more Brazilian tunes because they're melodic and beautiful and fun to play. So unless you're Brazilian, everybody plays the same five Tom Jobim tunes, which are nice tunes. But Tom Jobim alone wrote about three or 400. So I'm up to maybe 15. I'm hardly a Brazilian expert, but I do dearly love the music. I've been playing uh, a couple of things on my YouTube channel uh, that I've, I've added recently to my repertoire. I used to play and I've added them back again. I stopped playing them for a while. From uh, Tuni Nioita, who's an incredible guitarist, vocalist, composer, who's about my age. And uh, I certainly recommend that you check him out too if you don't know his work. But there are dozens of great Brazilian composers, musicians, probably hundreds. And uh, I, I dearly love the music. So we're going to do one of uh, Tom Jobim's more well-known ones. We'll put the melody at the end. Again, we'll just start with some improvising. Let's make this little quiz. So we're not going to uh, tell the people what we're going to play. We'll just start with some improvising. And why don't we do the same thing? Maybe trade some courses and maybe trade some mates, Mike. Sure. And then at some point at the top of the tune, maybe I'll grab the melody. And we can, maybe we can split the melody if you'd like to play the second half of the melody. Without, gi without giving too much away, do you, do you end on the 2-5 at the end? Or do you, because some people have cut I Typically, yeah, I don't, yeah. Typically, I don't play the one until the very end of the tune. Okay, I yeah. suspect the fact that we've already mentioned the composer, many people are going to know what this is probably after about three bars. We're not making this too hard for the guys, you know. Hey, it's the weekend. Let's kick back a little. Uh, so uh, let's start with some blowing, and then uh, I'll play the uh, first half of the melody. And then if you'd like to play the second half, yeah, maybe at the very end of the tune. We, that's the only time I actually end on the, um, on the one is at the very end of the tune. I usually just cycle back two, five, and then back up to the two dominant, which I think is what the way Tom also composed it. Uh, so maybe I'll start this this round and let's uh, let's do some uh, alternate alternating courses and then at some point I'll just one of us can indicate that uh, we're going to eights. Sound reasonable? Sounds good. I'll make this our tempo. One, two, one, two,
Mates now, Mike. A few more eights.
Very nice, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So I suspect I suspect people who are watching after about two bars knew what we were playing since we told them the composer already. But that's even though that's been played thousands of times and recorded probably hundreds of times, it's still a beautiful tune. And I, I particularly love the way the Brazilians phrase when they sing in Portuguese. They have a beautiful way to appear to sort of float above the time and still imply that pulse in a very kind of delicate, beautiful way that's unique to their culture. I think I love it. Can you do a video um, or a lesson video on Mike's master classes with Janelle Castro where you kind of focus on? Yeah, I've done stuff? a couple with Janelle. Yes. I mean, I approached Janelle for, for the same reason that I approached you. I saw some postings that he had done that I really liked. He's in Brasilia. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if he's traveled in the States. He speaks good English and uh, is a very good guitar player. So when you have a chance to hang out with a Brazilian and talk to him about Brazilian music, it's obviously very instructive. Um, you know, I, I have a sense of how they play rhythmically, although I've never really studied it on a page, but I've listened to enough of the rhythms that I have a sense of how they do it. And uh, they like it, actually. I think they're flattered when we try to play their music, even though we don't necessarily play it as well as they do. Although there's some Americans who play it quite well, actually. My friend Paul Myers in New York plays it quite well. And he's played with a number of uh, Brazilians in and around New York. And he also went to Brazil. So I've not actually been to Brazil. I've been to Argentina many times, but I've listened to a lot of Brazilian music. So I have a notion of, of how to play it. There's a great book uh, for any guitar players watching that I recommend from another very good Brazilian guitar player named Nelson Faria called The Brazilian Guitar Book. It's Chuck Shear Publications. And Nelson has dozens of examples, short four-bar examples with voice leading and the rhythms notated to get a sense of, you know, sambas, bayons, trotos, and so forth, and some actual longer songs and solos. It's a very good book. But I just got my notion of how to play this music by osmosis just by listening to them. And just getting a sense of roughly how the rhythms work, just kind of by watching and listening as opposed to writing it even down. But I dearly love it. And I love, I love it so much when they sing in Portuguese. And I have a few friends actually in the States who are not Brazilian, but they've learned Portuguese well enough that they can sing it quite well. And to me, it's my favorite language for singing, I think. You know, I try to imagine them singing the melody when I play it. And uh, it's music that if, you know, for those of you watching and listening who uh, have not spent a lot of time with the Brazilian repertoire, I'd highly recommend that you check some of it out. Besides Tom Jobim, people of his generation, people like Luis Bonfa, Joao Gilberto, who just passed away in his late 80s, who did this beautiful, understated, mostly slow, very often just playing him alone with uh, his nylon string guitar and singing. And for most of the tempo is really, for the most part, pretty slow, but so beautiful. Uh, their version of pop music is incredible too. People like Caetano Veloso and uh, Gilberto Gil, Joao Bosco. Um, I really like Filo Machado. He also is quite a good jazz guitar player in addition to doing more pop oriented things and singing. You know, there are hundreds of great Brazilian musicians. I mentioned Tonino Horta, Milton Nascimento, so many, mm -hmm. you know. So do check out that music if you haven't uh, spent a lot of time with it. It's well worth investigating. So one thing I like to do. Milton no, Nascimento, he, uh, he and Wayne Shorter. Shorter. Yeah, he and, yeah, the we record he did with Wayne Shorter, native dancer in the 70s. It's quite a nice sort of blending of American jazz with Brazilian music and sort of pop orientation. It's a beautiful record. I think Herbie's on that record too. So yeah, it's, uh, there's, it's a huge body of music. Some of their pop stuff, another man I like very much, I heard about a year and a half ago in um, Oakland, California, I had a chance to say hello to him as Yvonne Lins, L-I-N-S. I think he's every bit as good a composer as Jobim, now in his early 70s, still singing and playing piano beautifully and composing. He's written a large body of work too, and terrific player. Nice. So, I mean, lots of great Brazilian musicians to check out. So one thing that I like to do, and I think you do too, is to sometimes get outside our comfort zone a little bit and kind of reimagine the tune with another meter, another key, so I don't think we've done this together, but I suggested body and soul as a waltz and you were game for that. So why don't we give that a try? Sounds good. Okay, now uh, we can put throw the melody at the end on this one too, if you like. You wanna start with the chorus? Sure. Let's trade some courses for a while and then we'll just go to maybe some, some eights. <laughs>
grab the melody out here for the last day. works as a waltz what do you think yeah that works really nice i like that yeah i like it that way too probably one of my very favorite solos of all time is that coleman hawkins solo which is the first really important uh i think we've mentioned this before maybe in some of our discussions maybe the first important uh, tenor jazz saxophone solo recorded in 1939 and he starts with an improvisation pretty forward thinking for 1939 still sounds amazing to me yeah incredible I mean, listening, I tell the younger players, please go back and listen to some of the swing players because there's some incredible solos there and containing solos from people like um, Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, Don Bias, Ben Webster, amazing. Um, I've seen some of the good younger players actually putting up some uh, posts on Facebook where they're playing along with or they're transcribing some of these solos. There's a the Yotam Silverstein version of playing uh, four, five, six courses of Don Bias on rhythm. It's killing and he's got it all memorized and he's playing it beautifully right along with Don Bias. Sounds just amazing. I was listening to this recording so. yesterday of Ben Webster and Art Tatum. I forget which album it is, but wow. it's so funny. They, they're just two like complete opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, you have Art Tatum Absolutely. Doing crazy harmonically advanced, like, you know, 30 second out runs. Then Ben Webster is playing like so lyrically and it's, but the yeah. contrast worked really nice together, you know? Interesting. Uh, yeah. Sometimes putting people who are, have very different approaches together can yield a very interesting conversation. Yeah, you know, there's some footage, speaking of two different approaches, there's, I don't, the only video of Charlie Parker I had seen is that version of Hot House with him and Dizzy, black and white TV show. But I saw some, something in the last couple of months of him playing a ballad with Coleman Hawkins. And same thing, Coleman Hawkins is more lyrical, more swing bass, and Bird is playing more bebop, or even though it's a ballad. But you can hear clearly that Bird respects Coleman Hawkins and is maybe tempering his approach a little bit to kind of reflect his respect for Coleman Hawkins' approach. But yeah. Coleman Hawkins was very forward thinking. He did a record with Sonny Rollins and um, and Paul Blay, I think, in the 60s. It's kind of an interesting record. And uh, so Sonny was, you know, surrounding himself with some of the young up-and-coming bebop players. He came out of the swing era. But a number of the swing players did make that transition and embrace some of the bebop language, but kept sort of their lyrical, melodic sensibilities from the swing era, too. So in some cases, it's a pretty interesting combination. So people like Coleman Hawkins, Don Bias, uh, who some others who maybe did that. You hear, you know, you hear in Dexter Gordon's sound, sort of a reverence for the swing players, even though he was more bop oriented. So there's a lot you can take from swing era players, for sure. You know, we shouldn't assume that all the important jazz happened after 1940. It did not. A lot of it happened before. Yeah. Do you think a lot of those for guys sure. played by ear for the most part? Or? I think they did. I mean, I think uh, many of them didn't read. And some of them did. If you came up in some of the big bands you read. But a lot of the folks, I mean, you think it was really... Uh, the music was passed down by oral tradition by just going to clubs and hearing the masters play. In the old days, there was sort of kind of competition. Some trumpet players supposedly would put handkerchiefs over their hands so you couldn't see how they fingered a, a particular run. And sometimes people would get up to play and, you know, the experienced players would call something in another key, the key of B, you know, some really odd key for a fast tempo on something just to try to school the younger players a bit. There's a story about Charlie Parker getting up and he was pretty young, trying to make a little bebop rig, a riff. He was 
in the process of trying to formulate it, but he didn't have it together yet. So he started a phrase and kind of stumbled. This is in Kansas City where he grew up and Joe Jones just took a ride symbol and threw it across the stage and landed right at Bird's feet, pretty humiliating. So Bird went away and spent the whole summer woodshedding like crazy. And he came back in the fall and you know, quite a bit better than he had been when he started the summer. So that, you know, a little bit of schooling in the old days was sort of tough love, but it, it was the old tradition. You learn by just listening to guys and they probably wouldn't necessarily even be able to talk about the theory themselves. You just watched and listened to them. And, uh, you know, things completely changed when jazz moved over into an academic setting, obviously. In some cases for the better, in some cases maybe for the worse, because there's something to be said for really training your ears simply by listening to something over and over. Although the theory is useful. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a shortcut for us. It allows us to kind of categorize and label harmonic information that we can then use maybe a little faster than if we just try to do it all by ear. Do you think so I think the benefits really to both guys were doing it all like we're developing that language by ear, just kind of experimenting with stuff that they knew and trying to throw it, you know, figure out ways to throw in some chromaticism and stuff like that. I, I think, well, I think Disney and Charlie Parker and some of the guys really did study the harmony and the theory. So they did know theory for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think some of the beboppers also were playing by ear, but I think when you get to the bebop era, a number of folks were reading and if you listen to some of Dizzy's big band charts and even some of the small group arrangements, there's some fairly ambitious, complex lines going on. And the, the, those folks were reading, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think it became more of a process of studying the music when the language became so much more complex with the bebop language. Right. You know, swing players, for the most part, were playing very singable solos. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Beautiful, you know, right. and very lyrical. Then I think the music got so much more complex one of the reasons it lost this popular audience, I think, is initially nobody could sing a bebop solo unless you were a jazz singer who wanted to learn those lines. You couldn't <laughs> sing any of those solos or sing the melodies for that matter. So the language became much more complex. So then indeed, some of those folks did study. Charlie Parker absolutely studied the music. So did Dizzy, so did Miles. And many of the guys could arrange and they could read. So it was another mindset. And a lot of the swing players initially didn't like that music. They felt it was too complicated. It just really sounded like patterns to them. And they had a point actually. Mm -hmm. So why not pull a little bit of uh, your inspiration from all the different eras of the music. I mean, go back and listen to Louis Armstrong with uh, Earl Hines, not Earl Hines. Um, am I thinking of, is it Earl Hines? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, on uh, Weatherbird. Is it Weatherbird? Some would play something from 1928. And uh, they sound amazing together, just piano and trumpet. And Louis was incredible. You know, I mean, in the early part of his career, he was an absolute virtuoso, for sure. For sure. Let's play some more. Um, cool. You know, we've done a few tunes where we're trading. Should we each take a, a little solo turn now? Sure. Sounds good. Would you like to go first? Uh, sure. I'll go first. Um, right. What are you going to play for us? A couple in mind. I think I'm going to do a Thelonious Monk tune called Reflections. Do it as a good ballad. one. Great. Thank you. 
Mike. Thank you. And Mike Monk wrote a bunch of great ballads. That's certainly one of them. I mean, I think his, you know, his repertoire is not performed so often unless someone does a Monk project. And he wrote quite a lot, a lot, quite a lot of nice music, I think. That's one of them. Panonic is a nice ballad too that people don't play so much. Yeah, I mean, many good tunes. I don't really play much of his repertoire. I'd like to learn a little more. I just play a few of his things. Panonica, Maybe I'll do one for you. Yeah. Yes, that's Panatica. Yeah, that's a good one too. Interesting bridge too. Great one. So I'm going to do something that's a little different. Uh, this is it's, I'm going to put the melody at the end on this one, and uh, I'll give you a hint. It's a Latin three. It's a well-known tune, but this will be done in a slightly different key. So, anyone have any comments or or uh, questions while we're? I was we're just thinking about that. We haven't dance? had anything yet, so uh, yeah, we're okay. doing more playing well, this people. time than last time. But if that's anybody okay. has any questions, shoot it into the chat or comments. A few people are watching still. Yeah, we got a um, we got fifteen people watching. Hey, good. welcome everybody. We're happy you're here. 
So you can tell this is on the informal side, nothing really scripted or planned, but we're going to go back to some uh, trading a little later on too, but I think we'll maybe focus on doing a bit of solo repertoire. So I'll do one. Let's kind of trade back back and forth playing solo for a bit, right? Huh? Sure. Sounds good. So well-known tune, different key, out of time initially, and then into a, a, a meter. <laughs> Kind of works with the Latin three, huh? Yeah, beautiful. Were you doing it in G? Yeah, I was in G. So nice. I did that with Steve Herberman, where we alternate keys G and B flat. Frank Sinatra recorded still in G. And it's kind of nice in G. And George Benson likes to yeah. play it in G too. So it takes a minute to transpose that one, but you know, it's not any harder than a lot of other standards once you just see the relationships. The tricky part is the spot in the middle where it goes to a one minor. And then uh, up to a five major, that's the spot which, you know, is a little trick. That part of the tune is a little tricky to transpose. The rest of the sense, all right. Other than that, it's fine. So, uh, you know, Latin three is one of my favorite little vibes. It, it gets you thinking about subdividing in slightly different ways when you're playing a Latin. And even a uh, three as opposed, to, as opposed to a swung three. So, so I enjoy so that. And also, that. somebody just commented, they said that the live chat's not working. I'm just trying to fix it real quick. But mm, you keep talking, okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything muted on my end, and I'm hearing you fine. So, meaning live chat, meaning they can't hear us speaking, or no, no, they can't post in the live chat. But it's ah, just okay. I oh, I got gotcha. you. 
Okay. Maybe that's why we haven't been getting so many questions or comments, huh? Yeah. Okay. Now suddenly we're going to have maybe a few comments. All right, if you guys want to try the live chat now, it should should be working. Let me check. Okay. Um, sorry, there's always it's, at least one technical difficulty. When we're that's okay. You know? Hey, somebody please say hello if you're inclined just so we know the live chat is working in case you would like to make a comment. This is our new world. Everybody All gets right, it. Yes. All right. It is good. It is working. Nice. Excellent. Okay. All right. So sorry if someone was trying to comment earlier and they were not able to, but now thanks to Mike, you can. So nice. please weigh in with any comments, questions, observations. We'd be happy to hear from you. <laughs> okay. We would be happy to hear from you and know your thoughts or comments or questions. Anyone who wants to log, to, uh, log in with a, a thought, please do. Want to play something else alone, Mike? I'd love to hear you play another something solo. Sure. Great. Sure. Let me do... Uh... I think I'm going to do Naima. Perfect. Listening to the, um, I was listening to the recording the other day of, of Michael Brecker playing it solo. Have you ever heard that? Hmm. I have not heard it. I'm sure it's oh good. My God. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty terrifying, actually. It's just like <laughs> um, Brecker plays saxophone. It just sounds like a toy. Like It's, it's so effortless. Everything he does. Yeah. yeah, technique was not an issue for him, was it? <laughs> I heard he was a nice man, too, by all accounts. It seemed I watched that documentary about him because he had that that um the bone that disorder where you need to get a bone marrow transplant. I forget mm -hmm. what it was called, but really sad story. If uh, anybody wants to see, I forget. I think it's called "The More You See" or something like. It's a documentary. I, had not, I didn't know there was a. I did not know there was a documentary about him. I'd like to watch it. Yeah, and they go over because his last album, Pilgrimage, was that was only that's like, a wonderful like, record. A month or two, it was like a month or two before he died. He was really sick during the making of that. And yeah, everybody I know in the interview they were saying how you can't even tell. No. I know. No, you can't. I mean, he apparently walked into the studio using a cane because he was he was ill, you know, mm -hmm. and he heard them all rehearsing his music. They put together that incredible all star group with Herbie. Herbie's on two tunes and Brad Meldo's on the rest. And the rest of the group is Jack DeJanette, John Patitucci and Pat Metheny. And Mike wrote some difficult music. And I'm not sure how much time they had to rehearse as a group because they were all busy and he was ill. But uh, boy, they played their hearts out for him. And he really did rally. And I think he died just a few days after the final mix that that recording kept him alive for a few months and it's a terrific last record. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, incredible. I agree. Yeah. And all the writing is beautiful too. It really is. Mm -hmm. And you do not hear someone that sounds infirmed or in any way incapacitated at all. He's playing, he's playing his heart out too. I think I'm sure he knew it was his last recording. Yeah. Albums like that are just so powerful. Like uh, the David Bowie, his last album too, I think yes. very shortly before he died and he knew he was dying. Yep. I mean, anytime. Yeah. You know, yeah, you can hear such conviction and such such passion in the music because you know it's someone making their final statement, and they know it too. Yeah, yeah really indeed. Nice. Well, let's hear your version of Raima. We'd love to hear it. All right.
Very nice, Mike. Thank you. I like the way you balanced space and density in that, and lots of nice voicings as usual. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate it. Great. Great tune. Maybe I'll do a little something unless anyone has commented that we need to respond to. Let's see. It's a good, it's a good question. Somebody asked, they said, could you talk about where you get your lines from? Do you prefer to create them based on your harmonic and melodic knowledge, or do you like to get them from recordings or a combination of both? 
Good question. It's both. And I think we can also initially, if you're trying to develop melodic vocabulary, it's really okay to borrow from other musicians. Uh, the melody of the song is a resource, and you certainly reference that melody in your solo and in your improvised chord melody, part of the arrangement that was not worked out when you were soloing. So the song itself can supply context for us. I think you and I also both like to use on the guitar, this is guitar specific, but a chord shape, as you and I have said in some of our lessons from Mike Geller, uh, a chord shape can be templated on the neck to develop lines just like an arpeggio or a scale can. So typically you and I, I think, tend to favor the wider intervals of the arpeggios because we hear the sounds of the chords that way. So I think it's in general, I think I tend to favor the wider intervals of arpeggios and I think you do too. So that might answer the question, but you know, certainly be aware of the song as creating a context for you to be able to, to shape your melodies and create melodies. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts you'd like to add? The only thing I would add to that is I would say, I mean, I guess it's different for everybody. It all depends on how you learn and what your process is like. But for me, it's always been a combination of both, you know, just kind of um, trying to get as familiar as I can with certain tonalities and certain scales and arpeggios and how to kind of improvise off of that. And then also take bits of vocab from different people here and there just through transcribing. But I think the most important thing when you're doing that is to, you don't want to get into the habit of just transcribing things and then just playing it back verbatim. Like every time, like try to take whatever it is that you like about that sound and analyze it and figure out what's going on. And then use that as kind of like a jumping off point for improvising off of it, I would say. I agree. Yeah. Transcription is an intermediate step in the process. We don't want to sound exactly like someone else because we're not going to play their lines better than them. And the idea is to personalize it, to feel like your own personality is emerging. So as you learn a solo or bits of a solo well enough to really have those uh, bits of melody uh, pretty firmly um, pretty firmly under your fingers and in your ears, you know what the sound is, you've analyzed it, you know where they're coming from. So then hopefully it's relatively easy to start to change the order of the notes, to um, maybe change the rhythms a little bit, to make it more personal. So you're, you're not feeling like a carbon copy of someone else, even if in the beginning you are doing a literal version of what they're playing, because you're trying to transcribe it and learn it exactly as they played it. But again, I would agree with you as part of a process to ultimately developing your own melodic sensibilities using someone else's ideas as a, as a beginning point, as a stepping off point. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Other comments, questions, or should we jump in with some more music? Uh, I think that was it for now. All right. We have an attentive audience that just prefers to observe as opposed to participate. That's really okay, guys. Yeah, Maybe I'll play an original tune. So hey, been good welcome throughout. everybody. We're happy you're here. I have 20 people show up in person these days. I'm thrilled. Can't remember the last time that happened. I think Sunday. Most people it, don't do much on Sundays. Maybe we picked a good day. True. I think we should. This is just. This should be the day we should do our, our live streams in general. Maybe, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I did do a gig last night outdoors, actually, for about 15 people with propane heaters blasting. It was actually sort of fun. It was warm, warm enough where I was. It was sort of semi-enclosed but covered with propane heaters blasting. And, it, you know, it's pretty relatively warm out here in the winter compared to the East Coast out here in Oregon. So it was manageable, not too windy or rainy, and it was okay. We got through it. That's great. So here's a little original I wrote. This one's called Springfield Sonata. <laughs> Thank you. 
There's that little one. Beautiful. I love that. I did that actually on a, I have a new CD coming out next month on the original label called Rain Painting. And I, I think I played you some of that in one of our private conversations. And my friend Dan Dean is an electric bassist and, and vocalist. And he actually layered all the parts that I'm playing. We do about 10 of my tunes, exactly 10 actually. And each one of them is a chord melody, a bit like that in the sense that they're, I hear the sort of the chords and the melody together when I compose. Maybe you can do an original for us today too. So Dan actually layered all his voices, doubling my parts, and in some cases, adding background vocals. And he scats well, too, in addition to being a great bass player. And he has his own recording studio and is a, a quite an accomplished engineer. So this was a year in the making, this project. But it's done. It's out next month on, uh, on Origin, and that's one of the tunes on there. And we do that one kind of rubato in the middle, where there's um, you know, sort of like the way I just played it, no time, although I'm improvising with a lot more space because I did it with two guitars and he's layering his voices. So it's kind of a different vibe. The melody is the same. The vibe on the improvising on our, our version of it is a bit different. But he's a very talented uh, musician, engineer, vocalist. And I was just flattered that he put all, he was willing to put all this time in to create these layers. It sounds like a band on every track, even though it's just the two of us. He had his drums and percussion too from his sound library. So we got virtual drums and percussion on about half of the tracks. But it sounds like a real drummer the way he layered it. And he was able to also duplicate all the harmonic rhythms in some cases playing along with the melodies with drums and uh, I, don't, I don't know how he manipulated all that but he knows how to do all this he's been engineering uh, commercial projects and, and jazz things for years so he's very uh, very comfortable in the studio smart guy that was the recording you showed me that had like the layer he did like the layered vocal harmonies exactly the melody. yeah so yeah, that, that, that i don't think I've, i'm not sure if i played that particular tune for you but yeah that's what we did he you know i started initially just by asking him if he'd be interested i had no idea if he'd say yes and um, so I just played some of the material for him and recorded it. So, and then he gave him all the charts and said, hey, if you want to take a stab at this, go for it. I had no idea. We had no idea what it would sound like going forward or how long it would take us or what the, ult what the end result would be on any of these tunes. It was really just kind of a stab in the dark. Let's have fun. The clock's not ticking. The clock's not running. If we got his home studio, we're not spending any money here. Let's just see what happens. But he's busy with his own life with a wife and two daughters and busy with what his other projects are. So I was flattered he took when he had time to do it, he would put time in and then send me tracks as works in progress and I'd critique them and talk a little bit about what we might add or take away. So it, you know, I think it came out well. I'm happy with it. What is what inspired the title? Oh, uh, that's just one of the tunes. No, I mean, what, what Actually, is, is there any uh, Springfield, like, uh, any significance? Oh, so that, that this particular tune, I thought to put your CD. Springfield is just a oh. town where I spent some time in Vermont, so it's not really a sonata. It's just a little play on words. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's not really, a, not a classical form sonata, obviously. But I just like, sometimes I'll just create little goofy titles. So my tunes actually are the names of towns. I've got songs like Nanty Glow and Throop. Those are towns in Western Pennsylvania. The titles are kind of funny. Tapioca time, because we made a little joke one time with a friend about dessert. So 
I just create these little goofy titles. You can yeah, put any meaning on it you want to. <laughs> Sometimes for me, the, 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 song, the title of the tune is the hardest part. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Pat Metheny sometimes says he'll just, uh, you know, he says, he says I, I've run out of titles because you've written probably 200 tunes at this point. Right. And he says, I wish I didn't have to think of a title. You have an original you'd like to play for us? Sure. Yeah, I'll do an original. Yeah, play something. Um, I don't think I've heard any of your, your writing, actually. I'd love to hear something. This is, um, this is one I wrote back in college. It's called Small Car Only. And the reason I call it that oh. is uh, there was this weird thing in the parking garage where I commuted at Western <laughs> Connecticut, where when you go into the mm -hmm. parking garage, the first parking spot on the left has a little sign that says small car only, but it's the same size as all of the other parking garages. <laughs> so same story as Good you. Title. I just needed a song title. And I saw that. <laughs> I was like, right, we'll small car that. only. I like that. I like that title. That works. nice mike thank you a little bit reminiscent of some of the brazilian stuff that i've heard a little reminiscent of Matheny, kurt rosenwinkel but you're not copying any of those sources you're finding your own way through these things um you know we might say to people i'm assuming you have that written out maybe some guitar players might be interested either in your tune or my tune so if anyone would like charts um i assume you have these things that you can send to people or maybe you do that already with your students so i think one of the best ways in my experience 
to learn new chords, to retain new chords, is in the context of an arrangement. So if someone played your song, I suspect they'd find a couple of chords in there that they could use in a broader application, playing over standard or one of their own tunes or for accompaniment. And same thing with my tunes. I doubt anyone would want to play one of my songs. However, there may be some interesting chords in there for somebody. So I've got about 15 of my tunes that I sent to you, I think is a PDF, including that one I played, Springfield Sonata. So if anyone who's watching, I would like material from either one of us sent to, to them to, to please let us know with an email or uh, probably the best way to reach me would be messenger on my website and i'm sure people can contact you in the same way so guys reach out if you would like us some material from us we're happy to send it to you yeah absolutely any other comments questions from anyone yeah we got a few um okay so the first one what are your thoughts on playing solo guitar and what is important to make it work interesting you want to go first? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess once again, it's different depending on what you're going for. But for me, I just try to always have a good sense of where the timing is and where the harmony is lining up. Try to keep everything mm -hmm. as clear as possible so that even when I'm playing, unless if I'm doing something more robotic where I'm deliberately kind of just taking my time and stuff. But if I'm doing something in a tempo, I want people to be able to still hear the melody, you know, as I'm soloing, kind of know where everything is mm -hmm. at all times. And it's for me, it's basically just trying to trying to find a balance between comping for myself and throwing in some chords when necessary and then doing some single note stuff and trying mm -hmm. to just find a nice balance of both of those where I'm not doing too much of either one. Um, trying to sort of emulate some like we were talking before, some of the pianistic sort of harmonies. Um, kind of emulating that whole thing of like getting a chord in the left hand, doing the melody in the right hand, trying to find little ways of, mm -hmm. you know, making that translate to the guitar. So that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. I think you're doing all that very well. Uh, I would agree with all that. I would also say that if you're not clear about how to play solo guitar, on, if you'd like to investigate this, and I would suggest every guitar player and think about, think about playing along because we can. And that opens up lots of possibilities for jobs and also some of the skills that you acquire playing alone also then help you playing in a group context. So all the things you just mentioned, being able to transition smoothly back and forth between chords and lines, not only in the arrangement of a chord melody, either yours or someone else's, but also when you solo, if you're the only chordal instrument, that skill serves you well also in larger group settings or even duo settings. Uh, you know, listen to, if you're looking for a strategy, it's also just listening to great solo guitar players even if you don't know exactly what they're doing, just to get the sound into your head of how someone else can perform alone on the guitar. So mainstream guitar players like Joe Pass, for example, uh, more pianistic people like Lenny Bro, Ted Green, Jimmy Weibel, Martin Taylor's a very good straight ahead solo guitarist. Uh, some of the younger folks who are playing well, Julian Lodge, Lage Lund, Gilad Hexelman. Some of these folks are using, Bill Frizzell likes to use some effects when he plays alone to layer sounds. All these people I just mentioned are really creative, really interesting, really different players. One other piece of advice, uh, if you're already playing some solo guitar, but would like to be able to critique yourself, it's really great to either record and or film yourself and then put it on a week later, listen to it a week later. So your memory of that performance is not as clear. You would be a little less critical of the small things that are not perfect. And to see how it sounds to you or the things that you're looking for, all the things you mentioned, Mike, in terms of balance, chords and lines, keeping the melody clear and, and in focus. Um, you know, all the elements that we try to balance, uh, it's a little easier to kind of critique ourselves when we're not physically playing, when we're able to just sit back and really listen and watch. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest recording yourself on a regular basis, not every day necessarily, but maybe a couple of times a month, throw on the tape on your tablet or your phone or however you could record yourself and then put it on the shelf for a week and revisit it. And that might help mm -hmm. you kind of fine tune strategies about what you need to do. Uh, you know, there are many, many uh, good chord melody arrangements available to you if you haven't had a lot of time playing solo guitar and don't know how to create your own chord melodies. Uh, if, in terms of sort of jumping in at a good basic level, now there's some guitar players who play really nice chord melodies that, that don't use complicated chords. The individual chords are not complicated. So the Joe Pass Chord Solos book, which I think you can still get. Uh, there's some West Montgomery transcriptions. West also had beautiful chord melodies, but the individual chord fingerings are not complicated. They're easy to play for the most part, but beautifully arranged in West's case with lots of block chording things that sound beautiful. Um, I like Ed Bigert's approach to comping very much. Oh, I like wow. Jim Hall's approach to comping. So, you know, there are a wealth of great guitar players out there, and some of whom focus more on chords than others. The ones I mentioned earlier that think more pianistically, people like Lenny Bro, Ted Green, Jimmy Weibel. So they're, in some cases, their chord fingers are more complex with uh, close intervals, open strings, inner voice movement. You don't hear so much of that in Joe Pass or Wes Montgomery, but that's not take, to take anything away from Wes and Joe, because they were both great players too, and could play good chord melodies. 
So depending on how ambitious you want your chord melody to be, maybe start with more basic shapes and beautiful arrangements. And then if you want to work into some of the more complex sounds later, you can. Mm -hmm. This might be more intermediate, uh, but I'm, Barry Galbraith had a couple of really good chord melody books that I Absolutely. did earlier on that really opened my eyes to how to kind of develop some chord melodies off of some you know typical standards. Sure. I haven't seen much of Barry's work, but I've heard from many people. I know he was a great teacher and player. And he could read anything too. He had a busy life in the studios in addition to being a great jazz player. But I've heard great things from a number of folks who've looked at his books. So I think they probably are a good resource. Someone told me he also did a book of Bach for the jazz guitarist, which I'd like yeah, to see. Yeah, those Olympics. are crazy. Do you have those? I, I have one of them. I don't know if it's a Bach, but it's like a harmonic minor studies. It sounds a lot like Bach, but it's just a bunch of A students to get comfortable in harmonic okay. minor. They're crazy. <laughs> Interesting. I've been limping through one page of the Bach uh, B minor violin partita, and it's got some shapes that line up perfectly as arpeggios. You don't have to have classical right hand technique to play it on the guitar. There are some quite nice shapes and modulations. I'll play a little bit for you sometime. I don't know if I'll ever perform it because I'm kind of stopping and starting, but I'm getting the muscle memory starting to kick in finally. And it's got some beautiful uh, octave displacement and some oh, things yeah. that sound very forward thinking for 1740 or whenever he wrote it. Definitely the voice leading is so beautiful. You know, you yeah, find beautiful. these little bits of, like I was talking about this with somebody the other day. I, there was one um, uh, sonata that was in, I think, D major, and he does this little mm -hmm. A, A7 to D little five when he goes. I just thought that was so pretty. Yeah, that's pretty jazzy, yeah. Just like little pieces yeah. of that that you pick up on. You're like, wow. So yeah. Especially like yeah. you yeah. said, for the 1700s, it's incredible. Yeah, because some of that work is way into our jazz book ever then actually let me show you one or two little pieces actually since you uh, gave everyone a little teasing fragment i'll do the same there's one part where he does this let me turn down a little he plays five in one octave and flat five in the other he does it again and so he's doing this and down here he does it as well and he's also got the what is it so lots of things with octave displacement quite beautiful um and I'm not sure if I'll ever perform it, uh, but it's sure nice just to go through some of it and line some of it up. So lots of nice, simple triad shapes and some flat nines, some Lydian dominant things in there. And, uh, you know, so Bach clearly was an improviser. You can hear his improvising intelligence at work creating some of these things, I think. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, we got a few. We have one that you okay. get a lot where they're asking about your seating position, how you hold the guitar. Sure, sure. So in my case, uh, and this, we have kind of unusual guitars. We might talk about these. This instrument was made for my friend Roscoe Wright. He designed it. Uh, it's called a soloette. And this is a solid graphite headless neck with the tuners down here. And the graphite neck is bolted onto a piece of maple. I have a two pickup system uh, going here for the, for the pickups. It's RMC piezo. So I've got a little bit of piezo going, but not much. And this is an Andy Timmons DiMarzio humbucker which you'd think would not be an ideal choice for jazz because Andy's a great blues player, very high output, but it also has a nice clean sound. And the, the rest of the body, these are plastic tubes that a friend made some, uh, some uh, cloth covering for. So this part of the body uh, that looks slightly darker detaches and it goes, uh, the guitar travels in a case the size of a fishing rod case. So it disassembles in about 10 seconds. These little plastic tubes come out of little metal inserts in the maple body. And um, so it's very easy for traveling. And I like the way it sounds. So the way I hold the guitar has to do with trying to facilitate some of the larger reaches for chords. So if I had the guitar down at a normal angle, some of the stretches that I like to play would be difficult because my hands are not big. So with the guitar up at this angle, I can play a shape like this or a shape like this or like this. I don't play those shapes all the time, but I play them sometimes. So, um, you know, if you look at any guitar player that plays some extended voicings, very often the neck is up at a slightly higher angle. Why don't you talk about your instrument? Because it's not a typical jazz guitar either. Yeah. Um, one question in regards to what oh, you just okay. said. When you Do you normally sit down at gigs typically? I have to sit. Yeah, I haven't stood up playing a gig mic in 35 years. So I always mm -hmm. sit, typically either on a stool or if I'm on the road and there's no stool available, then I'll just sit on something. But because of the way I hold the angle, I think it would be impossible to have the guitar at this angle with a strap standing up. So I, can't, I cannot honestly remember the last time I stood up at a gig. And actually, as you get older, it's kind of nice if you've been sitting down for 35 years, because then people don't notice right. when you suddenly have to sit down when you're 85. Because I've been sitting down since I was probably 35. There you go. <laughs> um, so, so my guitar... You... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, please. I'd, I'd, like, you, I'd, like, I'd like people to, to, to have you talk about your instrument. 
This was a guitar that I got back in high school. I wasn't into jazz at the time. I was much more into like shred guitar and, and metal and stuff like that. And fusion. Fusion was really how I got into jazz because I wanted to get good at fusion. And I had a bit of a rock vocabulary already. And then I went to a camp and I took a fusion class. And he basically said, you know, if you have your rock vocab, you got to get a jazz vocab and then sort of fuse the two together. Um, so then when I started playing jazz a lot, I did, I used a Gibson L4, but I would play some gigs where I would do some, you know, stuff with distortion or some more rock stuff and putting the distortion on the, the semi hollow body just sounds ridiculous. So I started using this more and I actually really liked the way it sounded for jazz. I had never intended on using this for jazz, but just for kind of the wide variety of things that I like to play, this is, is kind of just all encompassing, but it's a carbon DC 127. And this is like, uh, before they got bought, I, I forget which company they got bought out by, but they got bought out mm -hmm. um, within like the past 10 years. And uh, this was the original. Mm -hmm. Everything is just stock in there. I didn't get any, the pickups change or anything, but just uh, it's working. Use, uh, 11s with a 12 on top, which I, st I mm -hmm. took from Chris Morrison. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. And I always liked the way his guitars felt. So I started getting my guitar set up that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think both of our instruments demonstrate that you can get a nice jazz sound on a guitar that's not normally built for or dedicated to jazz per se. Ted Green got a beautiful sound out of Telecasters. So did Bill Frizzell and Julian Lodge. So basically any guitar that feels and sounds good to you can work for any style of music, really. So don't assume that you have to do what everyone else is doing. If you're finding a path that you want to go down or explore, um, don't worry about breaking the rules. Uh, sometimes intelligent guesswork or just following your intuition can lead you to some really nice places. Right. So I've got baritone guitars and fretless guitars that I never had played originally, and nylon string guitars, and you probably have multiple instruments too. And I would also encourage guitar players to have more than one instrument because your playing can develop and expand in different ways to accommodate a new instrument. You don't necessarily have to even plan in advance. Uh, a guitar will just kind of speak to you if you play it for a little while about things that work on that particular instrument. So all of my different, I think, yeah, almost all of my guitars are up on my, I think they're all up on my YouTube channel. So, and you've got a variety of instruments that you play too. So, you know, having multiple instruments gives your audience some variety if you're recording or performing and uh, your playing will expand in ways that uh, you don't necessarily even have to anticipate or plan just by having multiple instruments. So I would encourage everybody to have at least two or three. And they don't have to be expensive uh, custom built instruments. They can just be different. So an island and a steel, an acoustic and electric, uh, like I said, I like the lower tuning. So I've got three baritone guitars, one fretless, two fretted, and they all, they all sound different and they're all fun to play. And then when you're writing too, it gives you so many more tools at your disposal. Yeah, that's right. Although I haven't written specifically for a particular guitar, but I wouldn't mind doing that actually. I should try to write something on a fretless. It's kind of fun. I can't really play chords on a fretless. I can play double stops on a good day. But what I did was to have a fretted guitar converted and uh, the folks that did it for me put plastic strips in where the frets used to be. So the plastic strips are sort of your guidelines to help you play the guitar in tune. So you put your finger on the place where the fret used to be. So if I want to play a G on a fretless guitar, I just put it right on the fret where the fret used to be as opposed to where we normally play it. So I've got to look a little more, but I've gotten pretty good at it. I've been playing this guitar fretless for years now. And it's tuned a major third lower. And then the other two fretted ones are tuned a fourth lower, like normal conventional baritone tuning. Some guys go a fifth lower, but I think typically it's a fourth below. And you discover so certain voicings that work. Uh, I, my, I go, I go, um, yes, uh, C to C on the fretless, and then B to B on the on the on the two fretted baritones. Mm -hmm. So either third, a major third lower, but all the all the uh, relative pitches are the same. So I can play normal fingerings. Mm -hmm. It's also a great uh, exercise for transposing because if I'm playing any of those guitars with anybody else, I have to transpose every tune. Obviously, I've gotten pretty good right. at it. That's a good point. And it's yeah, I would argue that transposing is just a useful skill because it helps you see relationships. And so even if you don't want to transpose every song to be able to look at any new song and say, okay, what's going on here? Where are the key centers? Is there, is there anything obvious to identify there like a two, five, one and so forth. So transposing is a useful skill. And if you're playing with singers, they really appreciate you're trying to accommodate them if they need to place a tune in something other than the original key to accommodate their range. So you look at, you look at the third fret and that's E flat. Uh, yeah, although I'm not thinking in those terms. If I'm playing with someone else, then I'm just transposing the whole thing. Yeah, typically, I'm not saying oh, that's an E flat. I'm just saying that's, that would be where the G would be. Right. When I'm playing with someone else, I just take the whole, I'm not, so I'm not transposing every individual note as I'm playing, and I'm just thinking right, about right, right. You know, chords and keys, <laughs> basically. I guess I could do that. That would be a little too much thinking if I'm playing a line and trying to think, okay, now I'm playing what looks like a G, but it's not really a G. You know, it's really a, an E flat. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So, uh, but you know, just in general, I'm thinking key centers and chord qualities, that kind of thing. Hey, let's play one more tune before we ring off. Unless there are any sure. other questions. Yeah, one more, one more question for you. Okay. Um, All right. So, uh, he says, "Hi, John. Do you use your own stock voicings for your for arranging melodies, or do you create them, or do you do both?" I do both, actually. So um, sometimes I'll discover voicings just as a result of trying to play a chord melody on a tune or write one of my own, and then I'll use those voicings in other settings. I just played a. Um, we play the opening section. I don't know if we talked about this in our last conversation, like not when we did a concert, but when you and I had our last hang. There's a Wayne Shorter tune that some friends introduced me to from the 60s called Rio. And the opening section has an interesting diatonic. I'll just, I won't play the whole melody, but I'll just play that opening section to show you a couple of voicings I discovered from the tune that I will use definitely in other, in other pieces. So that sort of answers the question this fellow uh, asked. So the tune moves from a B flat major to an A7 to a D7 to an A flat major, totally non-diatonic. So the B flat starts with a major third on top. So I could play something like that, but I thought if I've got all this real estate below me, why not put the fifth below it and play? So that's the voice that came up with for the B flat, just with the five and the flat five. It just looks like kind of like a C13, but I've got the F in the bass as a B flat. And then the next change is an A13 flat nine, it's got the uh, major third on top. So I just thought I could play an F sharp triad and put an A in the bass. And that's really a nice A13 sharp nine, basically. Mm. Sorry, A13 flat nine that has the major third in octaves. And I discovered that also is a nice movable shape in a whole bunch of different places as A major, A7 and A minor. So that's an interesting movable shape. So it's going from this B flat to the A13 flat nine and the D. And then the A flat is, it's got that third on top, uh, sorry, the nine on top, but I thought, why not put the flat five and the five, it said A flat Lydian in terms of Wayne's chart. So I thought I'd put the five in one octave and the flat five in the other here also. So there's nine on top, perfect fifth, major seven, tonic, flat five below it. So I discovered this voicing is an A7 and this voicing is an A flat major, just as a result of playing those opening bars of Rio from Wayne Shorter. The point being, I'll use those shapes and those sounds in other tunes. I'll find a place to use them. So sometimes a chord melody will suggest a voicing. Uh, and sometimes I'll just use sort of intelligent guesswork to say what, what notes are possible in terms of a given chord that I can make it sound interesting. So that could be an open string, a close interval. You know, I've just got a sort of a loose, like you do, sort of a loose set of preferences for how I want voicings to work and make them sound a little different than the usual voicings. And all my tunes you know, have voicings that I have used in other places too. Mm -hmm. That Springfield Sonata tune I played earlier had an E and E uh, any Lydian that had the major, so it's like Lydian sharp nine. It had the major third and the sharp and the uh, sharp nine in it together. So that A flat major could also be an E seven if I just if I just take away the D, I can put the E flat in there. So it's, it sounds just like E Lydian, but what what makes it sharp nine is the open G string. So it's like A flat harmonic minor. So in that case, for the, here's the Wayne Shorter tune I just played. That's an A flat major, but it could also be E Lydian sharp nine. If I just don't play the D natural, play something else other than the D. It could be this, or it could be this, or it could just be this. So again, voicings in my case was sort of intelligent guesswork, and and uh, the, the question um, raised a good point, which is sometimes the song itself will help you to create a voicing. But I also use conventional voicings like you do. I'm not always looking for complicated chords to play. Sometimes uh, the best choice to make is a very simple choice harmonically. So I play all the basic chords that everybody else plays. But sometimes I love to depart and go into some voicings that are a little unusual. So I'm always looking for voicings, always. Maybe you too. And I would hey, say well, let's the, go out the chord melody, the chord melody stuff we were talking about before too, like like reading out of chord melody books and stuff like that, like the Barry Galbraith mm -hmm. and the um, yes. the Joe Pass books. A lot of times there too, you might just pick up on a specific voicing that you really like, and then it just becomes part of your repertoire. Like I, I remember learning so exactly. many voicings from that Sid Jacobs, uh, Bill Evans book. Absolutely. That Absolutely. I just like with all these nice open strings that I just know now, like these B major. <laughs> Like all these really yes. nice B major nine voices yep. and stuff. And I got it from just yeah. learning chord melodies from somebody's book. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, if you're looking at a chord melody book, maybe you're just looking at one bar of a chord melody initially mm -hmm. and not necessarily assuming that you want to play the whole arrangement, but maybe take two or three chords out of a chord book or two or three chords of one bar of a chord melody arrangement, and then use those chords in one of your own arrangements or a simple two, five, one, some way to retain it. 
Again, the best way to retain the shape is in a context. So it can be a short cadence like a two, five, one or an actual arrangement of a tune. And then that chord is a part of your vocabulary. The, you know, the ultimate result of all this homework is you just see notes that are available to you. You can kind of compose on the fly with chord shapes just by adding intervals or moving things around inside a chord. So if you know that a B major could be this to start with, but it could also be this or this, whatever it happens to be. So if I see those notes that are available to me, So if I'm seeing B major, I know the open G string is my augmented. So, so some of it is knowing shape, some of it is knowing the notes that are available to you, some of it is knowing if an open string applies. So you have the ability to take an existing shape that you know and then create some small variations on that shape by adding an open string, moving a note up or down a half step. So there's simple ways we can get additional mileage out of one fingering. And then again, using these new shapes in a context so we don't forget them. Good awesome. questions from everybody. Hey, should we play? Should we, should we play another tune to, to close our session today? Sure. Let's Sounds play one good. together. Let's do like a you know like a sort of an upstander that's kind of fun. Something like you in the night or what is this thing or solar or you know just something a bit bright. What do you feel like? Uh, I could do you in the night and the music. That's a good one. I'm going to show you. We won't do it now, but I'm going to show you maybe for one of our other lessons. You and I talked about a modulation in that tune. I've got another modulation now that a friend suggested. Actually, it's Dan Arkimon. You know Dan? He's down in uh, Norwalk. Good player. I've never met him, but I know who he is. Good guy. And he's, he's actually getting his master's now with, uh, with Rich Goldstein at heart. He decided to go back to school a little later in life and get his master's. Good player. He, sort of an unusual player, too, with a, a headless guitar. Uh, nice guy. And uh, a, lot, a lot of the same harmonic language that the, the tune I like. So yeah, I think I, you and I talked about you and the night in the two keys of D minor and C minor. Have we talked about that already? That modulation? Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay. So what Dan suggested was starting in E flat minor, playing the first, we won't do it now necessarily. We can just do it in one key if you prefer. I think you and I did the two keys before. What Dan suggested do, what was is the it, first the eight. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Dan suggested starting the first eight in E flat minor, then the second eight in D minor, and then doing that modulation down chromatically on the bridge and playing the last eight in C minor. So now three keys instead of two. Hmm. That, that's Actually, we don't have to, and I'm just laying that on you. Now, you never heard this before. We don't need to do all this now, but modulation, as I said earlier, is a great way just to see relationships. So I think, do I have it in the three keys on my YouTube channel? I might, but you know, building modulations into an arrangement is a fun way to see, again, see relationships and give yourself some, some interesting challenges. Uh, we could just do one key if you prefer, or if you're up for the two keys with the modulation of the bridge, we can do that. Do I think preference? I could do the two keys. Just walk me. It's it's the the A and yeah, the, the beginning yeah. of the bridge are the same. Yeah, the yeah the A section of this for the people who don't know this tune, you and the nine the music normally would be C minor. So it's one to five, one one dominant to four minor, and then two half diminished five one major. So that's the A, which happens twice, and then the bridge normally would be A flat seven. This is in the one key of C minor to G7, then back up to A flat seven, then maybe A half diminished D, so uh, six half diminished two dominant, and then and then a five back to one, and then the last A does not uh, uh, resolve to C major, it just turns around in C minor. So C minor, five of one, uh, five of four, and then everything two beats, D half diminished, G7, C minor, some version of A half diminished or A7. So the last uh, section, the last A is just turned around to C minor. There's no reference. There is no reference to C major for the last A. So the arrangement that you and I talked about before, Mike, uh, involved starting the first half, the first two A's, up a whole step in D minor. So now we're right. playing, and then E half diminished A seven. And that happens twice. Then the bridge, we're going to split the first half of the bridge into, well, I'm going to split the bridge into two halves. The first half would be as though we were in D minor. So we start in B flat seven and then A seven. And we're, then we continue down chromatically as though the second half of the bridge were in C minor, then A flat seven. And it could be A half diminished G uh, to D seven rather, and then G. And then the last A would be in C minor as, as the original key. And then the very last bar could be C minor A seven to resolve back up to the new key. Right, okay. So if that's too much to keep in your head, we can do it all in C minor. That would be the way oh, that's that fine. Be yeah, the way I, most I people play. Okay. So the next time we meet, I'm going to give it to you in three keys. Yeah, so the third key would key be E flat time. minor. Yeah, every, every every eight bars, we switch to a new key and the bridge is cut in half. The first half would be in D minor, second half in C minor. Is this kind of thinking and arrangement useful and fun? I think it is. 
So I've probably got half a dozen tunes with arrangements with modulations in them. But also if anyone who's watching is interested in trying to develop your transposition skills, just take any song that you know well and practice playing it in other keys. So play Stella in G or play Blue Bassa in F sharp minor, you know, or play all the things you are in some other key besides the original key. So, you know, just you get, you can get good, anything obviously improves with practice. So you can get good at doing something by doing basically. Chick Corea says in one of his little videos, so how do you compose? You compose. <laughs> okay, Chick, there's a little more to it, but there's, there's, a, there's a point to that. Some people try to write something every day and maybe they keep 10% of it. So I don't compose that way, but some people find that useful. Just try to write something every day. I think that's, that would be, that's a little more ambitious. I don't have that kind of ambition in that area of my playing. But, uh, you know, you find sort of the work ethic and the things that challenge you in ways that are fun and interesting. But I would definitely encourage everyone to work a little bit on modulation. So we're going to do the two keys. For those of you who know you and the night in the music, we're, again, we're playing the first two A's and the first half of the bridge in D minor and then modulating down chromatically to C minor for the last day. And the very last bar could be C minor, two beats, two beats of A7 to get back to the original key of D minor, our new key. Should we try? Let's could be it. in time, could be out of time. You want to go first or I can? Uh, why don't you go first? Okay, I'll do it out of time initially. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
You like that in the two keys? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. It lines up perfectly with the descending chromatic in the bridge. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I think modulation, you know, I'd love to do a little more with you, but I have to run, unfortunately. But I oh, think, no, you know, I would, encourage, I would encourage everybody to, you know, to think a little bit about modulation as a tool to create fun arrangements and also just to improve your skills, not only in terms of transposing, but just seeing relationships, which means that any set of new changes, you have the capability and the ability to absorb faster. So our goal is to essentially be able to memorize anything that we're looking at quickly so we can get our eyes off the page and transposing is a skill that helps you do that. Also, if there's ever a tune that you've just played over and over and over on gigs, it could be a nice way to mix it up, challenge yourself a little more, kind of keep you more on your toes rather than just I agree. playing the same tune over and over and over again. I agree. So change the meter as we did today with body and soul or change the key or create modulations. These are all ways to make a, a new tune that maybe feels an old tune that feels a bit stale, maybe a bit more challenging and interesting. So guys, uh, whoever has watched and logged in, first of all, thanks to Mike for setting up our meeting. And let's, let's plan on doing maybe maybe these once a month if you'd like to, Mike, I'd yeah. love to. Yeah, and we, you know, we'll pick a Sunday. Sunday seems like a good day for everybody. So yeah, um, we sure appreciate everyone watching. Um, you are very happy to have watched this for free. No donations are required or necessary, but if anyone likes this enough and has a little bit of money they can spare, we'd certainly appreciate a donation of any amount. And I will pass along half of that to Mike. But we will do this again for you in any case. And if any of you would like to contact us to get any of our written materials, Mike and I both teach online, so we have lots of good things we can send to you. And do check out our YouTube channels and our lessons together on Mike's master classes and my classes on DC Music and True Fire and lots of records on Origin CDs, a couple of new ones out. And um, anything else you'd like to mention to the folks that you have coming up, Mike, or things that you're doing? Um. Not really. I mean, uh, we'll keep doing this once a month. I'm really enjoying this. We will. Uh, other than that, just I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link to your channel in the chat right now. Everybody that that'd be hasn't, great. Be sure that'd to be go great. Over there and subscribe to John's channel. And I hope yours is there too, so people can see what you're up to. Yeah. You're posting good things every week too. Yeah. So we try to with our YouTube channels do weekly posting so that you guys are getting fresh content. And I'm I'm also once a week uh, posting a video with my help Sebastian that uh, Mike now knows my friend in Germany, Glassman. He and I work together. He's doing all my YouTube posts. So I do one a week on the True Fire YouTube channel under my name, different video, and then one a week on uh, my YouTube channel. And Mike is doing weekly postings on his YouTube channel. So we're trying to keep it entertaining for you guys. So thanks so much for watching, everyone. And Mike, uh, let's stay in touch and let's connect for another another lesson together soon, too. So let's just plan on checking in, in the next week or two. Sounds great. Always a pleasure to do these. Thanks a lot, John. For me, too. Always a pleasure to play with you and see you. So everyone, thanks for watching. Take care. And uh, Mike, we'll be in touch. Sounds good. Thanks again, everybody. We'll be back in probably a month or so for another one. And we'll hope to see you then. That'd be great. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Mike.